Hey everyone, how's it going? How's everybody liking liking everything so far? Is it good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I can continue to add to that. Um, real quick before we get started, uh, this picture right here. Does anybody happen to actually know where this picture is taken? Show of hands. No. <laughs> so um, this picture was actually taken. This is probably the most iconic picture that you can take along the Appalachian Trail. Uh, this particular um, uh, picture was uh, it's taken at a place called McAfee's Knob. It's near Roanoke, Virginia, which is relatively close to uh, to my home office uh, in Lynchburg. Um, and, and I thought it was actually relatively appropriate because it's uh, you know it's a guy uh, uh, you know uh, uh, overseeing uh, uh, some some clouds there. Uh, so I, I felt it was relatively appropriate. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Frank Ford. My actual title at Genworth is Application Development Manager. Uh, my real role is more of a, an IT architect. Uh, I was originally hired as a Java developer, so I have a development background, and I've been at Genworth for 13 years now. Can I hold it a little bit? No, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so what is Genworth? How many of you have actually heard of Genworth in, in this particular room? Anybody? Hey, a couple hands. Hey, there you go. Cool. All right. So we're a financial services company, primarily selling uh, long-term care and mortgage insurance. Um, we're headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, my home office, like I said, is in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, and the company traces its roots all the way back to uh, 1871. Um, there was a company called Life of Virginia that was founded in, uh, in Richmond. Um, because the long-term care insurance products that we sell are considered health insurance, we are uh, bound by HIPAA regulations, which adds a significant layer of complexity when we start talking about uh, data processing, where we can store data, uh, what workloads we can, we can put where. Um, and I also gave a talk at uh, GitLab Commit uh, about our journey to DevOps. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a, there's a YouTube link. Um, I have been warned that I tend to sway a bit in the video, and it might make people nauseous if, you are, uh, if you're watching. And if anybody notices me doing that right, right now today, go ahead and, and just yell or, or something and tell me to stop, and I'll, and I'll try to stop. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to go over Genworth's uh, multi-cloud journey uh, kind of in, in our roadmap. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the technologies that we're using to help enable uh, some of that. And then uh, some considerations that we, that we had uh, along the way. So this is a extremely high level uh, roadmap of uh, kind of where we were and kind of where we are and kind of where we plan to go with uh, our, our, our cloud migration strategy. So uh, everything started with uh, containerizing our uh, existing legacy applications. Uh, like I said, we, we're an insurance company. We have a lot of legacy applications. Uh, everything from mainframes to .NET applications to uh, job enterprise applications. Um, you name it, we have it. Um, so it, it, we look into how can we break apart these monolithic applications? How can we containerize the various components? How can we offer services that are available for um, uh, various customers to call? And uh, how do we make that available like centralizing business logic in various areas uh, and delivering consistent data? Um, next, we, uh, we're, we're a GitLab customer. And so uh, we're using the, uh, the GitLab uh, CI CD pipelines to, to manage our, uh, our build and deployment processes. Of course, automated testing uh, is extremely important in all of this stuff. Without uh, you know, automated testing, none of this really moves forward. Uh, I, don't, I don't trust manual tests. So, um, and then of course, uh, container orchestration. Um, you know, we, we started playing around with Docker uh, several years ago, and you know, I, you know, I, I started personally, and then, you know, you kind of go figure out, okay, how do I move this into a, a corporate type environment? And unbeknownst to me, there was another group inside the company that was also looking at doing the same kind of things, and uh, they bought uh, Red Hat OpenShift, and so that's the. Uh, um, Containerization and, uh, and orchestration platform that we are that we are currently using. Um, so we're here, uh, right, right there. Um, I know, and, and it looks kind of like we're in the middle of this. Uh, it looks kind of like we're in the middle of this journey, but we're really, really just at the beginning. So this is just the uh, the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, and of course, containerization isn't the only thing that we're looking at doing. It's what can we do um, serverless? What can we use uh, various other uh, products from uh, various other vendors like? 
you know, pinpoint for uh, for messaging Google uh, Firebase or Google Google was it cloud, Firebase cloud messaging for uh, push notifications to to mobile phones and, and things like that. Um, technologies. This is relatively run of the mill stuff. If you are uh, playing around with Docker or or something, just kind of getting started, just install Docker on your local machine and uh, and start having fun. Uh, when you start to get serious about it. Um, we have a Docker Community Edition box that you can point some stuff at. You can start playing around with uh, GitLab CI. You can run some GitLab runners out there uh, and kind of get your, get your CI process up and running. And then when you're ready to productionalize, uh, we will go ahead and move you over to, uh, to OpenShift. Um, in terms of external cloud vendors, uh, we use Amazon and uh, Microsoft Azure, um, as well as a few uh, fun other things down there, too. Um, so. All right, deployment. This is where things start to get interesting for us. Uh, so we're mostly on-prem, uh, with Red Hat OpenShift being the, the primary uh, means to do some of this. Um, I just touched on kind of the difference that we, uh, we use Docker CE and, uh, and OpenShift and kind of when you migrate from one to the other one. Um, so uh, the big takeaway here and what we're working towards is I think what we all kind of kind of came here looking, looking to do is developers shouldn't have to care where your workloads run. I shouldn't have to care about that. My development staff shouldn't have to care about that. Nobody should have to care about that. Um, that's, that's really kind of where we want to get to. Um, so the next part of the, 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 the conversation is going to be around some, uh, some considerations that we had. Um, vendor agreements. So uh, this this is one of these fun things that's just kind of a, a fact of life when you start getting into when you start getting into uh, buying software products and and, and dealing with uh, dealing with uh, these 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 vendors. Um, uh, you know, cloud computing it generally changes away from being a uh, you know I, I, it changes the traditional model of I'm going to buy this off the shelf piece of software, and then I'm going to pay 20% maintenance on this piece of software, and I have this fixed cost that I just roll forward um, every single year, and I can, I can kind of count on that. Um, you know, uh, with a lot of these being subscription-based and a lot of them being uh, consumable type things, I'm, I'm paying for the compute I'm using, I'm paying for the storage I'm using, I'm paying for uh, things like that. It's kind of it's changing changing the way that we're, 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 we're dealing with cost structures. Um, it, it's a big shift for your sourcing uh, organization and, and your finance organization. So uh, your, your finance wants a forecastable number that they can say, okay, here's what this is going to cost this month. Here's what this is going to cost the next month. Um, and, and of course, you could use some analytics and kind of figure out when do you have bursty loads and when do you have downtime. So, uh, for us, uh, the the big times are um, tax season, and then usually the month of January. Um, like I said, we we sell long term care insurance, and a lot of people go home to visit family during December. And if you have elderly parents or something like that, you may not, and and you don't live near them, you may not necessarily know that 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 things may not be all that great, and you you may come back and you may say, okay, I need to file a claim on the long term care insurance policy. So January actually is a is a relatively high month for us. Um, so we could uh, we could look at some of that. We can say, um, you know, we, we we can anticipate higher costs during January and tax season, and then after April, things tend to just kind of trail off. Um, so uh, that's uh yeah. All right. So finding finding a balance. Um, the the process of onboarding new uh, vendors can sometimes be cumbersome and can sometimes take a long time, um, at least for for us and I'm and I'm sure for for other organizations as well. Um, it can uh, it can sometimes take months to uh, negotiate a contract. Uh, you go back and forth redlining the redlining the items and and then and then agree to something. Um, this, if, if, if this is the way that we have to continuously onboard new products from vendors, uh, this adds a lot of time to the development cycle because uh, we, may, we may be 
Uh, developers just want to want to test things. I want to experiment with something. I want to play with something. I don't want to have to deal with any of this contractual uh, nonsense that, uh, that, that that the legal folks are making me deal with. Um, you know, I, I just want to do my job, but uh, what we have to do is to, to cover some bases. Um, the, the big thing here is try and negotiate contracts um, to open up a toolbox uh, that your development staff can, can use. Um, don't negotiate product to product to product. Um, that, that adds a lot, a lot of time. Um, the, uh, once you actually get uh, the developer and staff has, has played around with stuff and they decide on a particular solution, try and get that solution into a forecastable state so that your finance groups will, will be happy uh, and they can say, I can count on this spend every month moving forward. Um, so uh, right now, uh, general developers are able to use any product in AWS uh, or Azure as long as they meet certain security requirements. So uh, if a developer wants to start playing around with a new product in uh, AWS or Azure, uh, the only thing they need to do is make sure that they understand the workload that they are running, they understand the data that they are running through it, and make sure that that particular product that they want to use meets the requirements. So um, make sure that it's, for us, HIPAA is a big one. Uh, for other folks, it may be uh, something, something else, uh, uh, GDPR, uh, anything like that for, for some European guys. Um, uh, the new uh, EU-US uh, privacy shield. Uh, that, that, that may have some implications uh, coming up here, here pretty soon. Um, but as long as we can say that the service that the development staff wants to use at Genworth is, uh, is compliant with whatever regulation for the data they want to run through it, they, they can use it. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Uh, security, uh, I, I touched on HIPAA. Um, you know, again, understanding the data that you want to put out there. Um, you know, we're an insurance company. The cloud is scary for us. We don't necessarily like change. So uh, these are these are big steps for us to take. Uh, actually, signing agreements and, and getting real production workloads out out in the cloud. Um, you know, Amazon a couple years ago, I think it was 2017, removed the requirement to have um, uh, dedicated EC2 for for HIPAA compliance. Um, but what does your legal and, and compliance department say about that? Um, you know, not all of this regulation is external. Some of it's, some of it's internal. Some of it's, um, you know, your legal staff may not be comfortable with uh, having, having that data uh, out there like that. Um, and we touched on, uh, touched on making sure that the, 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 the data and the workload that you want to do is, 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 is compliant. Um, and, and the only thing that really our developers have to do is just confirm uh, that it meets those, uh, those security requirements. Um, workload management. Understanding the type of workloads that you're running uh, out, out in the cloud. Are you, run, are you running container workloads? Are you running serverless workloads? Are you using a particular product for a particular purpose? Um, are your workloads running in the most cost-effective space? Um, we, uh, we actually have a part-time person now who's tasked with understanding what uh, workloads we currently have running. Are they running in the right place? Is there a more cost-effective place to run them? Uh, and then any new workloads that we want to put out there, his job is to analyze that and, uh, and make sure that we put it in the correct location. Um, all right, so in conclusion, um, we're just kind of getting started on our journey. We utilize a, uh, a combination of on-prem and, and you know, the, the big cloud vendors as well as a few uh, SaaS and PaaS solutions. Um, the big things for us, like I said, is regulatory things, making sure that we stay in compliance uh, with, uh, with HIPAA and, and, and other, uh, other regulations. Um, so when we talked about the consideration for sourcing, contract security, and, and the workload management. Um, there you go, and thank you very much. There's my email and, and my Twitter. Uh, I will warn you that my Twitter doesn't really have a lot of tech information on it. I'm normally tweeting about either uh, Virginia Tech football or auto racing. So. Would you like to take some questions? Sure. Any questions, folks? Okay, Here I'll we go. start with you and then you. And then you. <laughs> Uh, hi, my question is, uh, I got an impression that you don't really have a central, like a platform team that takes care of the um, 
you know, the, the platform to run all those services? Like you're talking about different developer teams picking, I don't know, making their choices, is that right? Or did I get um, So we, we do have a, uh, a platform team. Uh, th come find me afterwards, I'll, I'll, I'll tell I have you. A lot of I will say we, 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 we do have a platform team. Um, that platform, that, that, that particular piece of the puzzle is in flux for us right now. Um, and come find me and I'll, I'll give you more information about it. Um, you said you let your developers use any AWS service. I was kind of curious how you think about uh, products in the AWS marketplace and if that simplifies your sourcing issues and paying people issues. The, the AWS marketplace is uh, somewhat of a concern for us just um, uh, just because the, I don't necessarily know that those those pieces are, are as vetted as the actual um, the product offerings from, from Amazon. Um, it wouldn't bother me so much if somebody can come to me and say um, this particular thing in, in the Amazon marketplace meets uh, certain compliance criteria. Uh, if we could do that, uh, I could probably check some boxes and we could probably move forward using that. But uh, for the most part, I tend to avoid it if possible. You ask developers to vet the security compliance of uh, cloud services. That sounds hard for them. How well does that work for you? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good question. Um, really, the way that we kind of we work this is the, the developers kind of come to us and say, I want to use this product. Uh, and then they turn stuff over to our security organization. And our security organization is the ones that actually tracks that down. Um, so we, we have a team that's kind of dedicated to, to handling that for us. And then they, when they come back after they've vetted it, uh, they'll say, yeah, you're good to go. Or, or no, you can't, you can't do this. So. Any more questions? All right, I'll come back. No, no, this is great. Maybe you could elaborate. What was the driver for you to go multi-cloud? Um, as I alluded to in the, uh, in the panel discussion, a lot of this is regulatory. Um, you know, we... We're trying to, to reduce cost in, in our on-prem. We have, we have an on-prem data center in one of our facilities. We have a contract data center uh, in another location in, in the country. Uh, and we're really just trying to reduce the, the cost of, uh, of those data centers by, by pushing stuff out uh, into the, some, of the, some, of, some of the big, the big cloud vendors. Um, the, when it comes down to particular solutions, uh, like I said, regulatory compliance is the main thing that's driving us to, to certain things. Um, so, you know, if Amazon released uh, the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I want to run a, uh, a sensitive workload through it, and it's not HIPAA compliant, I, I can't, I can't look at it, I can't touch it, I can't, I can't use it. Um, if uh, Microsoft comes along and says, "Well, we've got the same thing in Azure, and it's HIPAA compliant," well. That's probably where my workload's going to go if, uh, if that's the case. But really, cost reduction is the is, is the main driver. So you move your workloads from one cloud to another. You don't run them at the same time at two places. No, no, we don't. Thank you. Last question. All right, I'll be over in a second. <laughs> Thank you. So I get the, the gist, the, uh, the, the feel that uh, you're part of a very traditionally bureaucratic org that has a lot of compliance and, and slow moving parts, et cetera, right? Yep. And <laughs> that's fine. That's, that's great. Um, my we're, question we're, is... We're, try, we're trying to change that, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a slow process. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and you seem to be making great progress. Uh, that's actually what's interesting to me is you're moving towards this multi-cloud, cloud-native CI/CD world. Um, how does that fit with uh, the more traditional change management processes, and 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 how have you found that to be something that you have to tackle versus something you're not tackling right now? That that's actually a very very interesting and very very good question that I wish I could provide a a, a succinct answer to you. Um, 
uh, like the other gentleman over here talk to me after this and 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 I'll, I'll I'll give you a little bit more detail into into why I can't answer that question right now uh, that, that I that I really I really would I really would love to answer it but there's a there's some behind the scenes stuff that's, that's going on the 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 big thing is um, uh, I I have a very strict separation of duties that I have to adhere to I personally cannot modify any of the stuff that actually does uh, deployments to any of our production systems. Uh, there's another group that has to handle that, uh, that, that are, are technically not employees of our company. So um, that's why things get really interesting. So given that we've had two questions that, you know, there's juicy details that you can tell off Sage, might I recommend that you folks grab a table at the unconference section in mm -hmm. the Hard Rock uh, Cafe, because sounds like there's lots of discussion to be had. And Frank, if you would be willing, I think that would be fun. Sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Frank. This was awesome, as we could tell by the number of questions that happened. For all you folks, just FYI, Frank's so good at sharing knowledge and being part of this community and giving back. He, this is the second time, I think, if not third time, I've invited you on stage. Yeah. And he's very generous with his time and shares his learnings with yeah. everyone. So give him a big hand. Thank you.